He was a quarterback in a linebacker's body with the speed of a running back. Physically, he checked every box you wanted in a QB. And on top of that, he had a rocket arm and what looked like good accuracy coming into the NFL. So why did Dante Culpepper's career turn out the way it did? He was a star at little known UCF, which led to him being a top 15 pick in the NFL draft. He would team up with the incredible receiving duo of Randy Moss and Chris Carter and looked like he was going to be a superstar. But as the Vikings lost weapons and the team became more dysfunctional, Culpepper started getting exposed, struggling more and more with his decision making and accuracy as he was one of the most turnover prone players in the history of the NFL. Yet for a brief period in the mid 2000s, some were looking at him as the league's best quarterback. But then a horrible knee injury changed everything as he never got close to replicating his success and had trouble just staying on a roster. His overall career looks quite underwhelming, but his best years were some of the best seen at the QB position at that time from a passing and rushing perspective, as Dante Culpepper was the leader of one of the brief yet most exciting offenses of the 2000s. And even with the ups and downs, his career deserves recognition. Let's jog your memory. Dante Culpepper was born to Barbara Henderson in Ocala, Florida. Yet at the time, Henderson was living in a community home for unwed mothers and didn't feel she was in a position to care for her son. So she would ask one of the house mothers, a 62 year old Emma Culpepper, if she would raise him, to which she agreed. As although Culpepper still expresses love for his biological mother, Emma Culpepper is his mother. And she kept Culpepper in check, as whenever he would get out of line, she would straighten him out with her old school discipline, which Dante appreciated. By high school, Culpepper was a star for Vanguard High. He played most sports, but football was his best. Over the course of his high school career, he would throw for over 6,100 yards and 57 touchdowns, while rushing for an additional 927 yards. And in his senior season alone, he would throw for 3,070 yards and 31 touchdowns, while rushing for 602 yards, as he led the Knights to the FHSAA Championship, where they would lose. And Culpepper was also a star on the hardwood as he averaged 19.5 points, 11.3 rebounds, and 5.1 assists as a senior, as the Knights would appear in the state championship, but would also lose, as Culpepper was called for traveling on the game-winning layup, which reportedly became the inspiration for his touchdown celebration. Culpepper would be named Florida's Mr. Football as a senior, but he had lost a lot of recruitment interest as a junior, as he possessed a 1.5 GPA, and it didn't look like he would be academically eligible for D1 football. But with the help of UCF's offensive line coach, Culpepper made a plan and took it seriously at the last minute and was able to bring his grades up. And after his ACT scores assured his college eligibility, a lot of the big schools came back, but he turned them down, deciding to stick with the team that stuck with him as going into the 95 season, he would be suiting up for the lesser known University of Central Florida. As an 18 year old freshman, Culpepper was already a physical freak measuring at 6 foot 4 and 230 pounds, while reportedly running a 4 6 40 and able to throw a ball 85 yards. UCF at the time was still Division 1 AA, but was set to move to Division 1A the following season. Culpepper would be a true freshman starter for the Knights, and in his very first game would go 20 of 25 for 254 yards and 3 touchdowns in an upset of Eastern Kentucky. And he was soon being compared to another big bodied small school QB, who had just gone third overall in the NFL draft in Steve McNair. Overall for Culpepper's freshman season, the team would finish 6-5 with Culpepper throwing for 2,071 yards, 12 touchdowns, and 10 interceptions while also adding 5 more touchdowns on the ground. But now UCF was in the big leagues and it was time to see just how good Culpepper was. UCF was a passing team through and through as their leading rusher in Culpepper's 96 sophomore season totaled 339 yards on the ground. UCF looked legit in the first game of the year against William and Mary, as they would be up 10-0 at halftime, but then give up 27 unanswered in the third quarter. But a furious fourth quarter comeback would see UCF start the year 1-0 with a 39-33 win, as Culpepper had 307 yards and 3 touchdowns and another 87 yards on the ground. Culpepper would sprain his ankle in their second game and the injury would linger, as he would struggle over the next four games, as UCF dropped to 1-4. Then later on in the season, Culpepper would injure his shoulder on his non-throwing arm, as although Culpepper appeared in all 11 games, he was rarely playing at 100%, and UCF would finish the year 5-6, as Culpepper threw for 2,565 yards, 19 touchdowns, and 15 interceptions, 
while adding 102 yards and two touchdowns on the ground. The 97 Golden Knights may not have been the best team, but they could score, as their 34 points per game was top 10 in the nation, and it helped that Culpepper had a new top target in Saya Burley. Culpepper's junior season would be a huge step forward, as he would finish second in the independent conference in both passing yards and touchdowns. Although UCF finished with an identical 5-6 record, it wasn't an accurate representation, as they played a much harder schedule and had a lot of close losses. They would lose to Ole Miss by a single point in OT in the first game of the year, then would lose to South Carolina by two points the next week. Then they would nearly upset number 6 Nebraska in overtime in the third game of the year, leading to UCF being referred to as the best 0-3 team in the nation. After five games, they were 1-4, but over their final six games would go 4-2 while also going undefeated at home in those six games. As a couple of Culpepper's season highlights would be a 75-yard touchdown run versus Kent State, and then a few weeks later, he would have 480 total yards and six touchdowns versus Northeast Louisiana. UCF wouldn't get a bid to a bowl game, but they capped off their regular season with a convincing win over a 9-1 Toledo team. As Culpepper finished the year throwing for 3,086 yards, 25 touchdowns, and 10 picks while adding 438 yards and 5 touchdowns on the ground. But the bigger news came a few days after the season, as there had been a lot of talk that Culpepper would leave for the NFL, but he would announce he would be returning for his senior season. Culpepper was even better as a senior, as once again he finished second in the conference in both passing yards and touchdowns, while throwing a career-low 7 interceptions. In the first game of the year, he dominated Louisiana Tech, as he accounted for nearly 440 yards of offense and 6 touchdowns then threw for 406 yards and 4 touchdowns the next week versus Eastern Illinois. They would get embarrassed by Purdue, but then win 5 straight, and they were going into a November 7th game versus Auburn, sitting at 7-1, and, and playing for a possible bowl game bid. But late in the game, with UCF up 6-3, Culpepper wouldn't be able to corral a bad snap leading to a turnover, and Auburn would manage to take the lead with less than a minute left, and would end up winning 10-6. Then even though UCF won their final two games to finish at 9-2, they still wouldn't receive a bowl game invitation. But Culpepper had left his mark, as his incredible season saw him win the Sammy Baugh Trophy and even finish 6th in Heisman voting, as he would also break Steve Young's record for single season completion percentage, with a mark of 73.6%. As overall, Culpepper threw for 3,690 yards, 28 touchdowns and 7 interceptions, while also rushing for 463 yards and 12 more touchdowns. Culpepper left UCF as the all-time school leader in passing yards and passing touchdowns, and at the time was only the third college quarterback to pass for 10,000 yards and rush for 1,000. And going into the 99 NFL Draft, he was now listed at 6'4", 255 pounds. Culpepper may have flown under the radar a bit in college due to playing for a school like UCF, but the 99 draft was at the time considered to be a draft which could rival the legendary 83 draft as far as quarterback talent goes. However, this wouldn't even be close to the case. But still, the first three picks would be QBs, and the first round would see five QBs come off the board. And it was at the 11th pick of the draft when Culpepper heard his name. With the 11th pick in the draft, the Minnesota Vikings select Dante Culpepper, quarterback, University of Central Florida. Culpepper was a unique talent. He was bigger than most linebackers, yet possessed speed that could rival some running backs. But a quarterback needs to be able to pass, and Culpepper was more than capable, as not only did he have one of the strongest arms in the NFL, but at the time he seemed to possess unexpected accuracy, especially on the deep ball, and he couldn't have been drafted into a better situation. The Vikings were coached by Dennis Green, who had a track record of making the playoffs with some less than ideal QBs but Culpepper was ideal. The team was also coming off a 15-1 season and were a field goal away from a trip to the Super Bowl, and they had made it that far with a 35-year-old Randall Cunningham, who prior to the 98 season had played 13 games over three years. Culpepper wouldn't see much playing time this year, as Cunningham would start the season, then be benched for Jeff George early in the year, allowing Culpepper to spend his rookie year learning for the most part, aside from getting brief action in one game. But any great QB needs great weapons, and the Vikings had two of the best, as they featured sure-handed veteran star Chris Carter on one side, and then a second-year freak on the other side named Randy Moss. But Culpepper would watch from the bench as Minnesota went 10-6 and, and made the playoffs, where they would defeat Dallas in the wildcard before losing to St. Louis in the divisional round, as Culpepper finished the year rushing for 6 yards with one fumble. 
In a move that seemed ridiculous, Green let Cunningham and George walk in the offseason, deciding to make Culpepper the starter going into 2000. But Culpepper had all he needed to be successful, as on top of Moss and Carter, he also had running back Robert Smith in the backfield, who would have the best season of his career in 2000. And in the receiving game, the Viking star duo combined for over 2,700 receiving yards and 24 touchdowns. And with so many weapons, Culpepper was better than expected in year two, as he would finish top five in passing yards, while also tying with Peyton Manning for the league lead in touchdown passes. He would have four games with over 300 passing yards, and the Vikings would start 7-0, with Culpepper rushing for 73 yards and three touchdowns in the first game of the year. They would then lose the next two, as Culpepper turned the ball over a combined six times in those two losses, but he would redeem himself by throwing for 302 yards, three touchdowns and a pick, while adding another touchdown on the ground in a week 11 win over Arizona and then would follow that up with 357 yards and three touchdowns in a week 12 win over Carolina. The Vikings would win two more after that, as they were sitting at 11-2 late in the year, but would end the season on a three-game skid, even though Culpepper threw for seven touchdowns and just one interception in those three games. As Minnesota's defense gave up nearly 35 points per game across those three games, and this was the story of the Vikings season. They had one of the league's most high-powered offenses with one of its worst defenses, but their 11-5 finish was enough to win the division, and Culpepper's season saw him voted to his first Pro Bowl. Culpepper played great in a divisional round matchup versus New Orleans, as he went 17-31 of 31 for 302 yards and 3 touchdowns while throwing no interceptions, and also added 51 yards on the ground, as the Vikings won and made their second NFC Championship appearance in 3 years. But like 98, it would end in a loss. But this time, Minnesota got embarrassed by the Giants. They would be shut out as they lost 41 to nothing, with Culpepper throwing for 78 yards and 3 interceptions, while also losing a fumble. So a great year ended terribly, yet Culpepper's first year as a starter saw him throw for 3,937 yards, 33 touchdowns, and 16 picks, while also rushing for 470 yards and 7 touchdowns. Yet he would also commit 11 fumbles. Shortly after the season, the Vikings got some surprising news, as their 28-year-old star rusher was walking away from the game to pursue a career in medicine and avoid long-term injury. Then they dealt with tragedy over the offseason, as their Pro Bowl right tackle Corey Stringer passed away from heat stroke during training camp. So not only were the Vikings playing with heavy hearts, they were playing with a depleted offense. The Vikings' rushing attack took the biggest hit. As after Smith alone rushed for 1,521 yards in 2000, the entire Vikings offense had 1,609 rushing yards this year, with rookie speedster Michael Bennett leading the team, and Culpepper finishing second, with 416 yards and a team leading 5 rushing touchdowns. Moss and Carter continued their partnership, as the two combined for over 2,100 yards, and these totals may have been higher if Culpepper didn't injure his knee and only play in 11 games this year. But even leading up to the injury, he didn't look like the same QB as the year before. He started the year with one touchdown and three picks and a loss to Carolina, and after eight games, he only had one multi-touchdown game, and the Vikings were 3-5. and five. He had his best game against the Giants in Week 10, when he had 277 yards with four touchdowns and two picks in a win, but then the next week versus Chicago, he would sprain a ligament in his knee in a loss. He would try to go the following week versus Pittsburgh, but his knee was clearly hurting, and he would end up being benched which would be his final appearance of the season, as the Vikings went 1-4 in their final five games, finishing at 5-11 and and missing the playoffs. However, prior to their final game of the season, Dennis Green would be bought out of his contract and replaced with offensive line coach Mike Tice, as reportedly Vikings ownership felt Green was losing control of his players, as Moss, Carter, and Culpepper had specifically looked dysfunctional this year sometimes caught having blowups with each other on the sideline, and Culpepper's season saw him throw for 2,612 yards, 14 touchdowns, and 13 interceptions. But his ball security concerns extended beyond interceptions, as in just 11 games, he committed 16 fumbles, losing 6 of them. The Vikings offense had gotten even weaker, as franchise legend Chris Carter had used an opt-out clause in his contract to leave the team. However, a second-year Bennett would rush for nearly 1,300 yards this season, with Culpepper again finishing second on the team in rushing yards, and also second in rushing touchdowns, with a career-high 10. But through his rushing, along with the difficulty handling snaps, and just being in the pocket in general, Culpepper would find a way to top his 16 fumbles from the year before. As this season, he tied the NFL record, which was set the year before by Kerry Collins, as he coughed up the ball 23 times, while losing 9 of them. 
And although Culpepper deserves some of the blame for this, it didn't help that the Vikings allowed the fourth most sacks in the league at 49. But not to be outdone, Culpepper would match his fumble total in interceptions, as he would also lead the league with 23 picks. And he would have 8 games with at least 2 interceptions, while only having 6 games with at least 2 touchdowns. So Culpepper's decision making was definitely coming into question. But again, he was seeing a lot of pressure in the pocket, and outside of Moss didn't really have any great weapons to throw to. Moss would still have a great year with over 100 receptions and nearly 1,350 yards, but if defense is keyed on him, Culpepper didn't have much else, so he would be forcing it to Moss a lot. Minnesota started the year at 0-4 and were sitting at a horrible 3-10 after 14 weeks, but they would play for pride to end the year as they would win their final three, with Culpepper having his only two games of the season with at least 300 yards during this period, while throwing for four touchdowns and three interceptions. And although he rushed for three more touchdowns, he fumbled six times. But even with Culpepper's struggles, the Vikings were still a top eight scoring offense. Yet their defense would be bottom three, as they would finish six and ten, and again miss the playoffs. Culpepper would finish the year with 3,853 passing yards, 18 touchdowns, and 23 interceptions, while rushing for a career-high 609 yards and 10 touchdowns, but again, tying the single-season record for fumbles. But Pro Bowl Culpepper would be back in 2003. Michael Bennett would only play half of the 03 season due to injury, but the Vikings had a balanced rushing attack, as Culpepper was one of four players to rush for over 400 yards, and the Vikings were top five in rushing yards. They would get a decent receiving season from Kelly Campbell, as well as rookie wide receiver Nate Burleson, and Moss put together one of the greatest seasons of his career, with 111 catches, 1,632 yards, and 17 touchdowns as he and Culpepper were once again one of the most dangerous QB receiver duos in the league. Culpepper led the Vikings to a 2-0 record while throwing 5 touchdowns and no interceptions, but would injure his back in a Week 3 win versus Detroit. The injury would keep him out of the next two, but backup Gus Ferrat led the Vikings to two more wins, as they were 5-0 when Culpepper returned, and he would come back to throw for 277 yards and two touchdowns to lead the Vikings to a sixth straight win, but they would then lose four straight. Even though during their third loss, Culpepper had his best game of the season, with 370 yards, 4 touchdowns, and a pick versus San Diego. He would have two more games with three TD passes over the rest of the season, but after their 6-0 start, Minnesota went 3-7 the rest of the way, as even though they led the league in all-purpose yards and were 6th in scoring, they still featured a bottom 10 defense. But Culpepper was again a pro bowler, as he would finish top 10 in passing yards and passing touchdowns, while also recording his lowest interception total as a starter up to that point. But for the second straight season, he led the league in fumbles, this time with 16, as in his four years as a starter so far, he had coughed up the ball 66 times. But the Vikings' second half collapse left him at 9-7, and seven, which wouldn't be enough for a playoff spot, as Culpepper threw for 3,479 yards, 25 touchdowns, and 11 interceptions, while rushing for 422 yards and 4 touchdowns. During the offseason, the Vikings rewarded Culpepper with a 10-year, $102 million contract. Yet the upcoming 04 season would be the peak of Culpepper's career. Moss would have a down year that saw him only play 13 games. As for the first time since Culpepper became a starter, Moss would not be the team's leading receiver. The Vikings didn't have the same rushing attack as last year, but Culpepper made up for it through the air. He began the year with his first career 5-touchdown game in a Week 1 win over Dallas, then in Week 5, he would throw for another 5 touchdowns in a win versus Houston, and follow that up in Week 6 with 5 touchdowns in a win versus New Orleans. As Culpepper became the first player in NFL history to have 3 games with at least 5 passing touchdowns in a season, and he had done it before the halfway point. He would have another 4 touchdowns in a Week 10 loss to Green Bay, and overall would finish 2nd to Peyton Manning in passing touchdowns. But it was the yards he was really racking up, as he would throw below 200 yards just twice, while throwing for over 300 yards 6 times, with 2 of these games seeing him go for over 400, as he would lead the NFL in passing yards, which would earn him his 3rd Pro Bowl selection and see him finish 2nd in Offensive Player of the Year voting. At one point, the Vikings would be 7-4, but they would end the year on a 1-4 skid as they would finish at 8-8, eight eight, but would find themselves in the playoffs for the first time in 5 years, as they would get a wildcard matchup with Green Bay, and Culpepper played like a man possessed as he went 19 of 29 for 284 yards with 4 touchdowns and 0 picks in a win, setting up a divisional matchup versus Philly. Culpepper would throw for over 300 yards, but would have just 1 touchdown and 2 interceptions, 
as Moss was held to just three catches and the Vikings lost. But Culpepper's regular season saw him throw for 4,717 yards, 39 touchdowns, and 11 interceptions, while rushing for 406 yards and two touchdowns, and only committing 11 fumbles. But Culpepper had shown his best, and would never reach these heights again in his career. Shocking news occurred during the offseason, as the Vikings star receiver Randy Moss was traded to Oakland. Over the years, there had been reported concerns about Moss's attitude that the Vikings weren't happy about. But the likely breaking point was when he pretended to moon the crowd during the Vikings wildcard win versus Green Bay. So Culpepper's last great weapon was gone. The Vikings would have a decent receiving attack in 2005, but their top receiver Travis Taylor would only have 604 receiving yards. And their best rusher was second year Moel Day Moore, who had 682 yards and a single rushing touchdown. And on top of this, the Vikings would be without Pro Bowl center Matt Burke all season, as he recovered from hip surgery. And Culpepper couldn't have began the year worse, as the Vikings started 0-2, with Culpepper throwing 0 touchdowns and 8 interceptions. He would have his best game of the season in Week 3, when he had 300 yards, 3 touchdowns, and 0 picks in a win versus New Orleans. But after this, he would throw for 3 touchdowns and 4 interceptions over the next 3 weeks, as the Vikings were 2-4, and entering a game versus Carolina. Culpepper had started well, as he was 3 of 4 for 28 yards. But his game and his season came to an end on the final play of the first quarter. Culpepper was hit low at the end of an 18-yard run, and this hit would result in him tearing three ligaments in his knee, which would obviously end his season, as the Vikings lost to go 2-5. and five. Surprisingly, without Culpepper, the Vikings would go 7-2 and two the rest of the way, to finish with a 9-7 and seven record, but it still wouldn't be enough for the playoffs. Yet in Culpepper's seven games, he threw for 1,564 yards, 6 touchdowns, and 12 picks, while adding 147 yards and a touchdown on the ground. A couple months after the regular season, another offensive weapon in Minnesota was gone, and this time, it was Culpepper. The Vikings shipped him to Miami for a second round pick, as Culpepper was more of a backup plan for a Dolphins team who were hoping to sign Drew Brees. But the trade wasn't a shock, as Culpepper had already made it clear he wanted to be traded, and asked the Vikings to release him if they didn't find a trade partner. Culpepper passed his physical and was set to be the Miami Dolphins starting QB going into 2006. Miami was coming off a 9-7 season with Gus Barat as their starter, so bringing in a guy like Culpepper was hoped to push them over the edge. Culpepper would have his first 1,000-yard rusher since Michael Bennett in 2002, when second-year back Ronnie Brown rushed for 1,008 yards this season. He didn't have a Randy Moss to throw to, but the Dolphins still had pass catchers, like Chris Chambers, Marty Booker, Randy McMichael, and Wes Welker, who each had over 600 yards receiving this year. But Culpepper wouldn't be responsible for many of those yards. Culpepper had another bad start to the year, as after four games he had thrown for less than 1,000 yards, with two touchdowns and three interceptions, while also coughing the ball up three times. Yet he had also been sacked 21 times already. But with the Dolphins sitting at 1-3, fans were calling for backup Joey Harrington to replace Culpepper. After their Week 4 loss, Dolphins coach Nick Saban noticed Culpepper's shoulder was bothering him and would keep him out of a couple practices. But Culpepper and Saban would reportedly get in a heated argument after Saban decided to keep Culpepper out of action until his shoulder fully healed. Then later in the year, during the Dolphins' bye week, with Culpepper still not having played since Week 4, he would undergo surgery on his knee to remove cartilage. And with only a few games left in a soon-to-be 6-10 season, Culpepper would be placed on IR ending his year. As in four games, he threw for 929 yards, two touchdowns, and three picks, while rushing for 20 yards and a touchdown. After the season, Saban took the head coaching job at Alabama, which Culpepper was likely happy about, as it was now clear the two did not get along. And Saban eventually was brutally honest in saying that he felt the problem with Culpepper was not his knee, it was his head, as he hadn't been studying defenses enough, which resulted in him taking a lot of sacks. But going into 07 minicamp, Culpepper still wasn't practicing, as he hadn't yet recovered from his knee surgery, and eventually the Dolphins would trade for Kansas City's Trent Green to be their starting QB. And just a couple days later, Culpepper requested his release, and about a month and a half after that, the Dolphins would grant his request. Culpepper worked out for a few teams before signing with Oakland a couple weeks after his Miami release. The Raiders had just drafted Jamarcus Russell first overall, who had a lot of similarities to Dante Culpepper and the Raiders were hoping he could turn into what a prime Dante Culpepper once was. But for anyone who doesn't know, he did not. Throughout Culpepper's career, he had been about his money, and it looked like Russell was too. 
As Culpepper was signed as insurance while Russell was in a contract holdout, the Raiders weren't good, coming off a 2-14 season featuring Jerry Porter as their best receiver. Even with Culpepper being brought in, Josh McCown would begin the season as the starter, but he suffered injuries in their season opener and would not be playing at 100% in Week 2 until Culpepper got his first action in relief in Week 3, throwing for 118 yards in a win. Then in his first start of the year the following week, he would lead the Raiders to a win over his former team in Miami, as although he only threw for 75 yards, he had two touchdowns through the air and another three on the ground. He would start the next three games, throwing for two touchdowns and four picks, while also committing six fumbles, as the Raiders would lose all three. He would sit out the next two, before having his best passing game of the year in a loss to Minnesota, when he had 344 yards with a touchdown and a pick. But the following week, he would injure his quadriceps in a win versus KC, and would end up sitting out the rest of the year, for a Raiders team that finished 4-12. And, and in the seven games he played, Culpepper threw for 1,331 yards, five touchdowns, and five interceptions, while adding 40 yards and three touchdowns on the ground. Culpepper was a free agent, and although he was getting some interest from teams like Green Bay and Pittsburgh, it was only to be a backup, and he felt he was a starter. So at 31 years old, he would announce his retirement, as he would be watching the 08 season from home. And one thing he, and everyone would be watching, was the historically bad year the Detroit Lions were putting together. They started 0-4 before starter John Kitna went down with a back injury, then backup Dan Orlovsky would take over and go 0-4 before suffering a thumb injury. So the 0-8 Lions would give Culpepper a call and would eventually sign him to a two-year deal. And less than a week after his signing, he would be starting against the Jags in Week 10. But his first game back would only see him throw for 104 yards and an interception in a loss. Then the next four games, he would throw for four touchdowns and five interceptions as the Lions' losing streak reached 13. And during the 13th loss, Culpepper sustained a shoulder injury while throwing a late-game Hail Mary, which would end his year. So Orlovsky would come back and start the final three games as the Lions became the first 0-16 team in NFL history. And Culpepper's year saw him throw for 786 yards, four touchdowns and six interceptions, while adding 25 yards and a touchdown on the ground. The winless season got the Lions the first pick in the 0-9 draft, as they would select Georgia QB Matthew Stafford. Although there were some murmurs that Culpepper would be the starter going into 0-9, Stafford got the starting nod. But in week four, he would get injured versus Chicago, leading to Culpepper coming in and then starting the next two games, yet going 0-3 in those games. Stafford would come back in Week 8, sending Culpepper to the bench, until a dislocated shoulder in Week 13 would end Stafford's season. Then the following week, Culpepper would be a starter in one of Detroit's worst losses in franchise history, when Baltimore beat them 48-3, with Culpepper throwing for 135 yards and two interceptions. He would then get benched during a game against the Cardinals the next week, but would start the final game of the year, going for 262 yards and two touchdowns in a loss to Chicago, as overall Detroit went 2-14. And, and Culpepper's season saw him throw for 945 yards, three touchdowns, and six interceptions. And this would officially mark the end of Culpepper's NFL career. He would spend the following season in the United Football League and reportedly be close to signing with San Francisco in 2011, but nothing came from it. Physically, Dante Culpepper was a new breed of QB. His career at UCF really helped put him on the map, leading a new D1 school to relevancy. He got to the NFL and by year two was a starter, with Dennis Green as his coach and endless offensive weapons. He played like a superstar, but as his weapons left, his play seemed to fall off and his decision making got worse. He became Dante hot and cold pepper for a reason, because when he was at his best, he looked like the best. But when he was at his worst, he looked like the worst. He had a rocket arm and a great deep ball, but his overall accuracy really suffered as the years went on. And he was dangerous on the ground, but you held your breath every time he got tackled, because it could be a fumble. He put together a couple superstar years before a horrible knee injury, and after that he was never the same. But he didn't want to accept that, as even though he had clearly lost a step, he always seemed to view himself as an elite starter. As a whole, Culpepper's career was a disappointment, but when he was at his peak, he was one of the most exciting passers in the NFL, and the Vikings offense was fun to watch. And maybe his career pans out differently without the knee injury, but if at any point you're leading the league in passing yards and touchdown passes, you're doing something right. But that's it for today's episode on Dante Culpepper. Hope you enjoyed it, and make sure to subscribe for more videos like this one. If you liked it, check out a couple more videos on some underappreciated football players. Thanks for watching and see you next time.